Welcome to the Notorious Scoundrels, a Star Wars Legion podcast bringing you the latest news, general perspective, and competitive discussion. Hey, and welcome back to the Notorious Scoundrels. I'm Kyle. I'm here with Mike and Zach. How you guys doing? Doing good, man. Uh, it is another Monday, um, which is to say it's like every other day. Um, so yeah, I'm good. I'm great. I went back to work for the first time in like a week and a half. We were self-quarantining. And um, it's sad to say that I actually had more free time at work today, today than I did at home with my two kids and my wife. So um, today Maybe actually that. was um, a nice day of like, I got, a, I got a breath of fresh air. I was actually super busy at work. I, uh, I think but I had a nice super, breath of fresh air. <laughs> super interesting that you added your wife to the like lists of things that was like being a pain with occupying your time. Is she that... might be awake. She might. She might still be awake. So I, <laughs> I was like, God, oh, do I say it or do I not say it? Um, no. Uh, yeah, it was a long like twelve days of staying home. Not gonna lie. Uh, but we got through it. I'm back to work, and I got a, got some uh, a break from the kids, and I feel I feel ref- I feel refreshed. Go to work to get a break from the kids. Yep, I know how that is. Um, yeah, so uh, David is not with us today. He will not be with on the cast, uh, at least as a permanent contributor uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, that doesn't mean that he won't uh, be joining us at some point in, in a guest capacity. Um, as you know, David's been on our cast for like two years, basically since we started. It was me and, and Mike and David Um And it was uh, great fun to uh, come together and and talk about Legion. Uh, He's still a a great friend of ours. Uh, But he's going to go focus on Yavin Base, the streaming and and his blog and such. So uh, we wish him all the best and uh, certainly look forward to, you know, potentially continuing to partner on stuff. Uh, You know, where we still may get some guest appearances from him, some, some blog posts potentially. So... Uh, we'll see how that how that works out, but it's you know obviously been a great two years, and uh, you know Legion community is pretty small, so David's not going anywhere, and uh, he's still a good friend of ours, so we wish him all the best. And, and make sure uh, you know you check him out at on his Twitch channel, Twitch TV slash Gavin Base. Um, yep, I imagine he'll be he'll be streaming there pretty regularly, so um, I know I'll probably be hanging out in chat um, <laughs> as always. Yep, team league still going on. Uh, I think it's the finals now, right? It's the Germans and uh, and Bespin Biths, I think. Yeah, that sounds well right. Yeah. And uh, and very league coming up soon. Yep. So streams will be hot. Um, I mean, honestly, streaming Legion might be more fun than playing Legion if I uh, at some sometimes. I'm not gonna it can lie. Be. It can like, be. It can be. It can be. Yeah. It, yeah. It's it can be if you get a good game. If you don't get a good game, it's it, yeah. It can be. You know what, Mike? Grueling. You snob. Um. No. No. I. I agree. It, it, there are definitely games where it's like, all right, we're playing Long March, uh, Vaps or key positions, and we're gonna position for six rounds and hope for the best. Uh, those th- those those games, it's definitely like uh, trying to figure out how to like make the crowd happy for like three hours but but when the games are good like stream streaming is awesome it's, it's and, uh, fun yeah uh, and and of course david has i mean david's got a you know a great voice for it and uh, a great eye for the game so definitely catch out you know catch his channel yep uh all right you got any housekeeping for us mike um not anything super new uh we do uh we added a couple games workshop products over the best week or so um some extra like start collecting boxes so if you're looking to get into warhammer 40k um we've got some stuff for it also just a reminder to everybody you know with all these sweet new models coming out we do have contrast paints available on our web store um so you know if you're looking to kind of get everything painted easily um we we've got the stuff you need um but other than that, uh, I mean, you can always check out our Patreon. Um, if you're looking for a way to support us, we appreciate everybody that does that. Um, it's a good way to do that. And we've got, you know, some quarterly Patreon rewards uh, as part of 
part of that process. So, um, yeah. Awesome. All right, well, let's let's launch right into the news because we do have some news. Welcome to In the News. So, two weeks ago, we talked about the Atomic Mass Games shift a little bit. Uh, so, they did mention in their press release thing that key, quote-unquote, key members of the development team would be moving over. It looks like uh, that will at least be Luke Eddy. So, Luke Eddy posted on Twitter that he did make the shift to Atomic Mass Games, and he is a lead game developer. We don't know exactly what that means in the context of Legion, but he did say he would be doing Star Wars minis, and it certainly makes sense that he would specifically be working on Legion. So um, this seems like good news for the game, some continuity. Yeah, this right? is a, this is an oh, thank God moment. In my, yeah. My yeah. So, um, that's, that's all I could think about. I was like, oh, thank God. Uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you know, I, I'm still not super thrilled with how all this went down, but at least we've got somebody that we know, um, will at least stay true to the foundations of the game that exist, and we have an idea of, you know, the, you know consistency the consistency is key i think there and and things will probably still change to some degree but at least we know that there are voices on the team that knew what the plan was um which was not super clear um before this announcement so i'm thrilled about that luke thank you <laughs> yeah and <laughs> luke obviously a great guy and a, a very talented developer um so uh I feel I feel a lot better than I did a week ago. Yeah. Not that I was feeling bad about. Yeah, I was I was I was cautious a week ago. Now I'm cautiously optimistic. I was. All right, it's funny, right? So, as we know, I'm an admin on the Discord. It's like when like the Alex stuff happens, it's like I never really watch it, but there was like that show on HBO with Jeff Daniels. Like, I think it was called The Newsroom. So now, like the admin channel is kind of like newsroom. Like, oh, we got to make sure like the Discord's handled and the Alex news comes out. Same thing happens with Luke. So it's like twofold. Like, so like the first part of me is like the business side where I'm like, all right, we need to make sure like the news gets out properly and maybe we can get a hold of him and have him come on on Discord, right? And then finally, when like the like the professionalism of it like fades away, I sat down and took like a deep big breath and I'm like oh, this is like the best news I could have possibly have gotten. Because when we find out that Alex was no longer, you know, shifting and we haven't, we don't hear anything from Luke and you, you're really not sure if AMG or FFG or anyone's going to say anything at all. And it's going to have to come from Luke and you don't know when or if Luke will even come out and say something. You're kind of in this like waiting game, knowing if the other developer is actually making the shift. And that was like my main concern was that like, if both of them don't make the shift, I would have been very, very like weary of the whole situation. And, and what I mean by that is like, I, it's not that I don't trust whoever would take over the game to like make it fun and, and, and good. Like you can always take Star, Star Wars is Star Wars. You, get, you have whatever you bring with it. It's going to be fun. Right. Um, my concern was like the core concepts of the game. Um, you have to have someone that understands those core concepts. And if you start with a clean slate for a game, that's already been out for two, two and a half years, whatever it's been now, it's, it's a little concerning. So the fact that he's making the jump over or transition, whatever you want to call it, uh, either way, he needs an umbrella. I, I guess that makes you an outsider if you're in Seattle with an umbrella, but if he makes that move over to Seattle, which I, I believe he is, but listen, get a nice Star Wars umbrella, look like the outsider that you are, um, you know, Minnesota to Seattle, might not seem like a big change, but it actually is because Minnesota has snow and I'm pretty sure Seattle doesn't get snow. It's just always rain. It's the weirdest place on one of the weirdest places, but um, it's great news uh, and definitely a sigh of relief uh, for the game going forward. I'm a little confused, dude. Native Seattle people just get rained on. I, I don't know. I, I posted a joke in the discord and someone's like, Oh, if we see somebody with an umbrella, uh, we, we know they're an outsider and just, and so I made the joke, well, all right, I know you wear a poncho or something because like you have to wear something. I mean, you can't get rained on. I'm trying to remember. Um, I, I was there. I was there about a year ago. Well, a little bit more than a year ago. I'm trying to remember if I saw umbrellas or not. I, 
There was definitely a lot of like poncho esque stuff going on. Maybe that's a oh. thing. I don't know. Maybe I was closer to the head than I thought. I was kind of making a poncho joke. Of, I'm not gonna lie, but maybe that's what they do. Maybe that's what they do. Hey, if you Cal wear a poncho, Kestis wears a poncho. He's cool. So yeah. I love those ponchos, I, and I always change the skins on those ponchos when I get a new one. I'm like, oh, let's test this one out. Uh, I got, I hate him. I put one poncho on him. I'm like, I, what? What is this? Are we going to like a baseball game? What? I don't. I was anyway. actually like the entire time playing fallen order i was like why why is the only thing i could put this guy in a poncho like this right this is yeah. upsetting to me um yeah it's like the stock outfit or a poncho that's it yeah i mean there's like 30 different ponchos but yeah i yeah. i don't want one though Give <laughs> right me... exactly i loved him i don't know you crazy <laughs> yeah all right whatever anyway if you're from seattle and you know the origin of the umbrella joke uh please tell us what normal seattle people do in the rain besides and maybe the answer is they just get rained on and take it, you know. But uh, uh, yeah, let us know. I'm curious. <laughs> that I'm sounds like curious. the worst of all of the options. Well, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but my first question is like, you know, if you're carrying an umbrella in a city where it rains a lot, you're an outsider. I'm like, well, what what do you do when you're not an outsider? You, uh, I don't know. Uh, okay. You're just going to go outside? I don't know. Uh, anyway, moving on. What's it, hobby progress? Get out your brush and paint. It's hobby time. Do you, do you guys got any hobby progress? Um, I know my, I know you just moved, Mike. So 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 to be fair, and I'm not trying to set any expectations here because it probably won't happen. Um, but I did keep all of my clones in a travel case that is like in my room presently. Um, so yeah uh but i haven't done anything with them probably won't but and i and i brought all my i did not put my paints in storage my paints are with me they're ready to go uh everything's already primed i don't know we'll see doubt it but man i don't know maybe it's something about our last name but uh the barry the barry brothers here you're kind of in the same same situation um I'm not going to lie. I was, I was sitting at my computer last night and um, I keep my paint case like right next to my computer on the floor. And I looked down at it and I was like, wow, I haven't touched these in like three months. Um, I probably should get on that. And then I proceeded to just play Call of Duty instead. Um, so I, yeah, no paint progress here. Um, I haven't even picked up my Anakin. Uh, like I have my Luke still in a box. I don't know. The, uh, the desire to do these things, which doesn't make any sense because I have kids and I have the time to kind of do it now. Right. And, uh, when they go to sleep, you know, like, and since we're not playing like in real life, it's like, well, I can paint them now. When we do finally play, I'll have them all painted. I, I feel like that I actually need that extra kick. Like I need, I need like a turn in to be like, yeah, you need these things painted. And I'll be like, honey, I need to paint all these figures. I don't care if we're eating dinner at this table right now or not. I'm painting these clones. Um, so I've gone complete backwards on the hobby front, <laughs> like complete 180. Um, like there was definitely a point where I was like, Oh, I can have all these painted. I, I'll be ahead of the game. I won't be behind the game. Uh, no, I, I uh, no, the, the switch has flipped on me. No, I I'm with you. It is a little bit hard to stay motivated right now with no like actual events on the, on the horizon to get stuff painted for, you know, it's, like, it's definitely fun to paint just for the sake of painting, but we've been doing that for, like, eight, nine months now, so... <laughs> um, yeah, I get you guys. I did, in fact, make a little bit, uh, because I was so excited that I finally got my Darth Maul. So I said, screw all my other paint jobs that are half-finished in my queue. Uh, I'm just gonna go straight to this bad boy. So I did, in fact, finish uh, Mr. Mr. Darth Maul. There he is. I don't know how well you can see him webcam not not great anyway um yeah he's a uh, i'll post a picture of him somewhere um he's done i still have to do his probe droids i think i went a little heavy on the osl um uh dustin our own dustin from jagged brush turned me on to osl via airbrush which is great but as i i think i, I made this comment um uh back when i did luke you know, an airbrush hits everything in front of it, 
no matter how far away it is. So I actually tried to do some masking this time, but I still got maybe a little bit more surface area than I wanted. So anyway, it's a very bright red lightsaber. Um, I will say I tried a new lightsaber thing. So if you look at, maybe we can do this painting about painting lightsabers. If you look at like an actual like lightsaber in the art, it's, it's almost like white in the middle. And then whatever color the lightsaber is kind of rings it around the edges and in, in like a halo effect. You know, I had previously been painting lightsabers sort of like I paint everything else where, you know, you do like the dark, like Luke has a green lightsaber. So I did a dark green lightsaber and then I did like lighter greens to sort of zero in on the, the sharp part of the blade, so to speak, without ever actually doing like a white beam in the center. Um, and then I looked at Maul's box and I'm like, man, every lightsaber is literally just like, a, it's so it's so bright that it's just a beam of white surrounded by the color. So I tried that with Maul. It's, it probably doesn't come through on the webcam very, very well, but um, I think it looks okay. I don't know. I might try it on a couple of my other lightsabers. It's super easy to like fix if you mess it up because <laughs> um, it's just the lightsaber. You just paint over it in the original color. So I don't know. How was his face? Like how how was painting his face? Oh yeah, so uh, it was actually pretty easy. The um, I think we made this comment actually. We had Corey Devore, one of the sculptors, on a while ago, but um, like his his face is actually, I'm sure you can't see it, but his face is actually partially sculpted. Like the tattoos are very slightly raised off of his face. I don't know if you guys have painted like um, 40k banners or anything like that that have a design on them, but it's like a super thin kind of textured thing where where you're supposed to paint. So it's a little bit like paint by number. So the face was actually pretty easy. Uh, and it turns out with really nice clean lines because it's textured like that, so. Yeah, I, um, I find it like the lightsaber thing sort of interesting because <clears throat> it if you, lightsabers uh, and, and all the lightsabers in this game are like, definitely meant to be viewed in like a 360 capacity and like you can only do that like white line effect in one direction really right um so it's kind of weird like i don't know how it was with maul but like with like luke like og luke's pose right like he it, with his lightsaber sticking straight up in the air you kind of had to pick a direction that it looked right in and if you were going to do something like that um it's 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 a tough effect to get right, I think. It is. It's a little bit easier with Maul because unlike Luke, I mean, he's... So you can actually do it on two sides. You can do it on one side and then you can do it on the, the full opposite side. Um, you know, his lightsaber, at least in this pose where he's got it, like, behind him, it's kind of... The, the way that I did it, I just... I hit the, the side that faces, like, that way. So unless you're looking like directly behind him, like from this, this angle, you're going to see that white. So, um, you know, and even then I, I managed to do one like on the opposite side. So I think it's okay on Maul. There's definitely like an angle where, you know, it's, it's red rimmed with white instead of the other way around because you can see like, but it's like this angle right here, you know, and like when are you ever looking at that angle? So, um, it's a little bit easier on Maul, and I feel like other, maybe like Jedi Luke, um, I haven't fully applied this method to him yet, um, you know, where they have their lightsaber kind of parallel to the ground. You can kind of do like the upward facing one, and you're, it's not perfect. But yeah, you're right. It's, um, it's not exact science. Yeah, I think going back to what you said about like getting mall and like putting your backlog behind you. It's like whenever a character comes out, I feel like I do that all the time. Cause I'm, I get so excited to just be like, Oh, I don't have to, you know, paint. I was about to swear there. I don't have to paint seven models in a row in like a group. I can paint this one model and like, and like you put like all the attention to detail in them and you feel great about it. And then you look at like the troopers that you put off and you're like, I don't want to even, I don't want to do you guys now. Like I just want another character to do. Um, but I mean, it's just, I think it just goes for any kind of bulk painting, I guess. Right. Yeah, no, totally. And the way I finally got my B1s painted is was like, I'm not painting any more tanks or characters or anything until I get these guys done. So, 
Yeah, no, I'm with you, Zach. Just paint the characters and fill it in. Fill the rest in. All my Imperial characters are good to go. I've got like two squads of storm, three squads of yeah, stormtroopers. You know, yeah, there. but you say this and you and you and you beat Kyle with the Gray Bosk. So a long time ago, many moons ago, but he, he had a character that was gray that one time. He says it was one time, but you know, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I've beat Kyle every time I played with Bosk. So <laughs> yeah, you're one for one. Exactly. There we go. <laughs> uh yeah anyway uh so we actually missed a news item uh adepticon and lvo are both canceled which is not surprising but disappointing nonetheless yeah i mean not to go down the deep dark chasm of depressing stuff this year has been but for me it was like a little bit of a realization that like it's been a year, you know, like, it, like this, the same things are getting canceled again. Um, wasn't a great feeling, but I mean, to go down that hole a little bit more is probably like between the shift of FFG to AMG and two Adepticons being canceled. I would say that whatever tickets we had probably just don't exist at this point. You're talking you know? about my sweet worlds invite. Yeah. You <laughs> um, know, that, that was, there was a part of that reptilian rampage shot. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, you know, I think I think it's I think it's hard saying these words out loud because I think a lot of us put in a lot of work into winning those invites, right? Um, but it's pro- it's probably the re- it's probably the the real the realism of it is is that it probably doesn't exist. Like that that ticket is probably gone. Well, we'll see because yeah, yeah it's possible the community. Especially like we have no idea what AMG is doing for yeah, Mass exactly. play, right? For sure. But let's just say they're doing nothing at all. Um, the community has been tracking most, or at least a significant portion of the invites via Legion tournament circuit and other means. So like we as the community, I think have most of what the list would be. We could actually just run our own, you know, lost we should, worlds. If we um, were to do that. We should run list building at what was available to us in March. Oh, that would be so boring. No, that would be fun. That would be fun. Points updates too. Yeah, let's let's do all sorts of wildness yeah. to it. No. Let's do it. Anyway, I I I'm saying I think that's probably going to be the case. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't still have an awesome tournament scene and at some point in 2021, who knows? Uh, maybe it'll be Gen Con. Maybe it'll be Nova Open. Maybe it'll be Northeast Open. Maybe it'll be warfare. Maybe it'll just all be canceled until Las Vegas open again next year. I don't know. I certainly hope not. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, Yikes. Hey, look, man, I I don't know anything except that I don't know anything about this pandemic. So um I can yeah. tell you the moment that one of these tournaments sticks and it's safe to go, I am going to look my wife square in the eye and be like, I don't care what we have this weekend. I don't care whether yep. you have to work all weekend and someone has to watch the kids. I am taking my plastic toys and I am gone for that yep. weekend. 100%. Like, like no matter where it is, no matter what it yep. is, I'm doing it. Um, like that's just, the, that's just, that's <laughs> just like, how it's going to go down. That's my sister's wedding. I'll be like, have fun. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Peace out. Yeah. Here's a credit card. Drink however much you want. Make sure you get an Uber home. I don't care. I'll see you when I get home. Yeah, you know? yeah. exactly. There, I think it's worth noting there's going to be a lot of competing events, I think, when all of this is over. Sisters' weddings included. Like, I'm oh, expecting yeah. there to just be no a question. tidal wave of weddings and stuff. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on to our main topic. We, we've got a main topic? We do have a main topic. We've been rambling for like thirty minutes, and we haven't even gotten to it yet. This is it's par like, for the course. It's like the first time I. It's like the first time I got an actual outline together in like I don't know, 10, 12 episodes because I've been so busy with my freaking kids, and we're just rambling, you know. Dude, I'm impressed that with a infant you are here and conscious. <laughs> uh, I may have dozed off on the couch like okay. at like six thirty, you know. I have, I fall asleep on the floor daily, um, yeah. without realizing it. So, anyway, uh, <laughs> let's move on to hostage exchange. 
which is our uh, this is our last objective 101 i think right uh yeah i think so it's been a long road here because we've been kind of throwing some interweaving episodes but yeah i'm pretty sure it's the last objective um i'm gonna have to go back and check that have we done breakthrough did we actually do breakthrough we did yeah we did breakthrough yeah we saved the uh the worst for last Yo, I love this objective. <laughs> this objective is great. What are you talking about? I uh, think I, mean, I honest, think it's gotten way better since the points changes and the rules changes. Well, there's Just, there's a reason we saved it for last, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because now we're, it's a lot cleaner to talk about than it would have been two months ago. Yeah, we were, we were hope optim we were optimistically hoping that those changes would come in time for us to put off hostage exchange enough until the changes came. Uh, wait, I will wait, say are you trying was... to imply hostage exchange which was unfair? Are you seriously trying to say that? It's it's not it's not a question of that so much as NPE. Yes, standby sharing made hostage exchange very unfun. But there were there were a lot of and we don't have to get into all these because they've been largely fixed, but there are a lot of weird ru- like rules interactions with hostage exchange, like the fact that you know the hostage card applied to turn one but not, before, not turn, yeah. before that. So in theory, you could use like a scout move to engage a hostage unit in melee before before turn one, um, which you can't do now because you can't base units during deployment at all. Uh, now in the ROG, you also, uh, they also, you know, did things like define what enemy effects are, including some ambiguous things like Bane tokens. Um, they cleaned up a lot of the sort of like random how does this interact with hostage exchange kind of situations in the rules reference and we don't need to talk about all of them we can just since they've been cleaned up we can just kind of focus on how this works tactically i know zach this was a nightmare during last invader but don't worry <laughs> mike scouting party still works Scouting Look, party still stand works. by it's nowhere near as good as you think it is um <laughs> okay well let's so we'll talk about scouting party in a bit um well let's just talk about it right now because <laughs> so nice. let's put this into context a little bit previously the guidance on hostage exchange was basically like unless you have rex in your list you cut it period full stop right um and that was in a world clearly in which standby sharing was a thing i, I i'm not sure it was that clear cut i mean i think i think it was i think the the narrative was more if you are playing clones, this is in your list no matter what, and therefore you were playing Rex because Rex was really the only right. Like, like if Kenobi and Rex were on a similar power level, um, I think that Kenobi would have been just as fine. I I, th- I guess I'm trying to say I think the Rex thing was had way more to do with the fact that he was just the best clone general as sure. opposed to he was specifically the best clone general at hostage exchange. Yeah, I mean to put it in perspective, as someone that played you know plays Kenobi more than he does Rex, um, and I was playing Kenobi and Rex at the same time for a long time too. But whenever I would bring Kenobi and let's say I didn't have Rex, I would cut hostage exchange because if I ran into another clone list that had Rex. Even with Kenobi, I was still at a disadvantage because Rex is that good at hostage exchange. Just just for a general perspective, right? I mean, I think that that's fair. I think again, that was Rex has some inbuilt bonuses when it came to standby sharing that aren't immediately apparent. The first is that he's almost a hundred points cheaper, which means you basically can have one to two extra activations worth of standby sharing padding to kind of build into your list over a Kenobi list. Like a Kenobi list is super, it's just, it, it's very tight on points. It still is even after all the, all the adjustments, it, assuming you're using phase twos and all that jazz. Um, so I think, I think that that, that was one of the things that Rex brought to the table was that th- he just was, he was cheap enough to allow, the extra activations that like you're like okay this phase one's just gonna sit here and take a standby every game like um it basically gave you more room to enable the things that made it work exactly is, right yeah right. and i think kenobi was a little harder to do that I, I still am not sure that like like i i guess what i'm trying to say is that i think that in every non-rex matchup kenobi like any any clone list like prior to these changes any clone list was 
it was way advantage in hostage exchange regardless of who the commander was before before standby sharing got nixed because it if you knew how to abuse it it was just you basically win the game on turn one um which isn't a great feel good and there's not much your opponent could do about it um we don't really need to talk about that too much but um rex is still really good um i think so the, the crux of what we were getting at was scouting party working on the ho- actual hostage unit right um and, yeah yeah and so because the uh, wording of it is still the fact that when you do you place your ho- for perspective right you place your hostage unit first and then you make the speed one and then your opponent makes the speed one move with them right and then rex ev- eventually goes last because you want rex typically to go last because he can then move the units that he wants and he's usually got recon intel staple to him so he's making a speed two move and scouting party is as long as rex has line of sight and is at range one to two of a unit they get to move a speed you know the speed two that he does right from from scouting party and the the way that hostage exchange interacts is that the host your hostage unit if they are if they end up in range of rex will gain that benefit right because of the timing of it all it's all about the timing of the whole situation um i I think we've talked about it before in the past there are some deployments that you actually cannot get rex into a spot i believe i think it might be like long march might be hard to do it um and i think you mentioned rollout once before, Mike, and you have probably more experience than I do, but rollout and long march come to mind right away because those are like long deployment zones and your opponent should cohere the unit behind the leader. So it's hard for Rex to get into a spot for scouting party to actually trigger. But for the most part on those, on those deployment zones that are closer together or easy to kind of, you know, maneuver around the battlefield to get Rex into place, it will trigger and then starts, then it would start the standby, you know, avalanche that would even get them further, further, further um, down the, you know, down the field. What, what was the most, I think the most um, damning thing of it before the changes to standby was the fact that if you were to get scouting party and then you could also trigger standbys, that unit, even though they have a hostage could attack. I know the other, you know, they can't be attacked, but they can attack. Right. So you, you would also have the option to pull attacks off if you really needed to um, with those standbys too. So there's a lot of different, you know, the standby sharing, I think being removed opens up hostage exchange to a lot more lists, uh, which is kind of what I wanted to talk about the most today is like, I actually think that this opens up hostage exchange to be quite different of an objective and will probably be featured in a lot more lists going forward now that standby sharing is not completely gone um like there's still anakin and padme lists that you know could probably really thrive on hostage exchange especially anakin really if you think about it like anakin probably seems really good on hostage um because he can standby share with the hostage unit and he also has a lightsaber with jump and choke and so like he's set up really well but but it's not the same way that it was three weeks ago you know what i mean um, and that's a big deal. I do think that it's an objective we're going to see a lot more of now. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think like in assuming we like before any new meta shakes out, I think we can still safely say that clones, for the most part, still should be probably the best at this objective generally, um, due to the fact that they have access to exemplar. Scouting party is good when it doesn't cost you Rex. Um, which which is a lot of times you have to move directly at the the unit you're scouting um, in order to trigger that, which puts Rex in a very precarious situation, and and you don't have a lot of control over where he can go in order to actually hit that trigger. Assuming your opponent like did their scout did the the moves right and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that uh, what this ends up boiling down to is that like. Uh, you know, when we originally, I think, reviewed Hostage Exchange on the cast, we were like, oh, 
this is going to be a really good objective for force users force push is big you know force choke is big um jedi mind trick is big all of these abilities are you know once you can kind of hit them on on turn two with these abilities um it, it, things get kind of crazy very quickly um particularly if they don't have a force user of their own so i think that um uh, my expectation is that that may shake out to some degree. I think we've seen, and hopefully we've seen like the we've seen the cuts to the force users in this in this points update. You know, it's sort of unclear to me if it's going to be enough to kind of bring it back in style. I do think that like if you're Darth Maul, you're like just jamming this in your deck now because uh, infiltrate and force choke just make it so like you're the, their hostages like trying to run backwards and Maul like just is like hey you know um and it kind of turns into a bad day but um i don't know i i i could see some like weird stuff with armor blocking i don't know it it definitely opens it up i mean do you think it's do you think we can use shorthand like clones take it force users take it other lists still should not take it I don't know if it's that cut and dry. Um, so, like, I do agree that clones take it and, and force users take it. And then I think it gets dodgy. I think it gets, like, really strange. Because I was thinking about it earlier. Um, and I'm not saying it's, like, good for, like, a T47 list, right? But, like, a T47 list can now kind of, like, nuke, nuke the opponent's hostage carrier pretty, you know, pretty easily. And... They can also, and especially if you're bringing two T-47s, you can also then flank around the backside and hit like a strike team or something like that and start kind of like avalanching the game a little bit because the T-47 has like, I mean, it got its buffs, right? But now it has the speeder changes, a lot of different things. Now, I'm not saying it's necessarily something you stuff into a T-47 list, but what I'm trying to get at is that if you don't put it in your T-47 list, that I get it. But if you are end up being red, right, and you're playing hostage exchange, it definitely feels not that bad as opposed to before. I I don't think, right? For for an example, like I think armor in general seems like a bad idea for these kind of cards, like like on the face of it, right? Because like you can't interact with the hostage and stuff like that. But it ends up kind of being a points killed game, right? Hostage a lot of the time. And armor, the armors can can make up their points real quick, and like 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 think about the AAT. You wouldn't think that'd be good at hostage exchange because it just kind of sits at range four and shoots things, but it is because it ends up being a mostly a two to two you know a two to two tie right for the most part as long as there's nothing crazy going on in the game. Um, you know, because you get two points if you get the hostage back into your deployment zone. Most games are 2-2. Two, two. It comes down to points destroyed, and vehicles can destroy things. Um, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um, I, I think vehicle. this is still kind of a hard sell for me for most vehicles. I do think that, like, speeder bike units could be pretty good at this. Like, quick, like, decisive strikes, yep. um, I think, have a place... Uh, you know, I, blocking is sort of interesting. I don't think you want to take this with like ATRTs and stuff. Um, I, like I could maybe see it with, you know, uh, an AAT tank trying to block or something maybe. Um, but like the saber and the, uh, the gav, like because their sides are so exposed, it's kind of a hard sell to me. Um, I also think that so I also think that this is a little bit faction dependent like you're attaching yeah. an objective to a core unit which I think on its own kind of like makes this like the least attractive for rebel lists just yeah. because their core units are like the easiest to blow away they're often they only have have like a ha they don't take heavies these days or or a lot of them don't they, they're starting yeah. to do that more but even with a heavy five white saves that surge are like you'd you'd rather be a droid list 
in that yeah. scenario than a rebel list with a core unit carrying a hostage um, totally ju- just by sheer bulk of wounds so i think that um rebels are probably going to need a good reason i'm not saying rebels shouldn't take it i'm saying that they need a good reason to take it i think uh, yeah and, and maybe We're... that reason is like i brought operative luke today you know yeah and, and and that reason's great i think that that's that's a perfectly fine reason like operative luke should be able to carry a hostage game on his back if he needs to um but like sabine probably can't you know um, no it's like i could see it like let's say you're bringing like operative luke and like mandos you can do a lot of crazy things with both those units because like you can use operative luke to kind of like threaten the hostage and then use like the set of mandos to then steal the hostage from your opponent or something like that and then like try and get out of dodge because it, it it minimizes your speed by one right yeah, yeah. So I could. So I your could mandos like go from sp- Ren, yeah, know, like in there. like. So they go from speed three to speed two, rather than speed two to speed one, because that's actually the main concern for me for rebels, right? If you think about a lot of maps, how many times can you take two speed one moves from the middle of the map and get to safety? The answer right? is almost never, right? Right. You know? So that that's really the main problem when you bring in rebels with hostage exchange. Um, now it's definitely more viable now than again there was three weeks ago. But like most of the time you can't get away and then your opponent plays like a one pip when you don't really want to play a one pip because your one pip's probably tied to a character that you don't want to activate that early and you're not even going to get an order to that hostage unit anyways. So like you're not even going to have control of your hostage getting out of the threat that is about to probably take them off the table. That's the real concern is those two speed one moves usually aren't enough. Um, but if you have, like I said, like you said, operative Luke, and then if you have them paired with like Wookiees or Mandos or something like that, that could potentially go steal your opponent's, you know, objective. I, I do think there is a case for that um, where there wasn't three weeks ago because you just didn't want to face clones with it. But I do think there is one now. I agree. I, so I also think um, things that we haven't seen a ton of lately uh, or a ton of like things that are built to abuse them intentionally uh, are th- basically uh characters that have cunning or um characters with the first name han and last name solo um that are able to basically say i'm playing a one pip this turn i'm going first i don't care what you play i'm gonna get my hostage out on turn two or i'm gonna blast your hostage and be able to effectively take those actions knowing that they're going to happen because a lot of times on turn two in the middle of a hostage bout like whoever gets the first like good clean blow on the other person's carrier or gets their carrier to safety um often sets the pace and tone for the game and like i I think that you know clearly cunning units are pretty good at it um i think dooku is specifically very good at this because he's just like he's got a, a bunch of like hey come back over here um you know uh, he's got a lot of c- tools in his kit that work well specifically with hostage exchange but i i think krennic does too frankly like deploy the garrison is also not a bad option on uh the turn that the enemy hostage is trying to get away right you're like okay well my overwatch death troopers are just gonna gonna light up your dude as he runs away um or whatever and so um and i think that like i i could see a rebel list that like puts like a comms tech on like a rebel trooper unit with an uplink or something um throws hostage exchange in there and and han's just like go 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 you know it's just like kind of gets them out i I think that um han is cheap enough uh, i mean we we crapped on han a little bit a few episodes ago might have been last episode and i still think he's mostly pretty bad but like um i i still think that han's han's thing is like in the combo territory like the reason you take Han is not because he has Gunslinger and Pierce 2. It's because he's got sweet command cards that do weird and cool things. And I, th- I think that there's room in a Han list to at least think hostage exchange through if you want. Yeah, and actually Rebels have a couple specific tools for hostage exchange that are good. One of them is R2, you know, secret mission is huge on hostage because it's super common for 
both players to basically retrieve their hostage, and then you end up in a one to one situation. And R two potentially makes that two to one. And hostage is sort of like an all stakes brawl over the center. If you can set up a situation on sort of a weird deployment like danger close or battle lines or disarray where your opponent has to devote resources to some area of the battlefield that's not the center, even if R2 ultimately gets hunted down, you know, whatever those units are, units that are not focused on the primary uh, fight in the middle of the table. And R2 also gives you smokescreen, which gives you a free move in the command phase for your hostage unit. You know, you could use No Time for Sorrows to do that same thing as Rebels. Um, if you're Luke, you could use Serve your Master on him. So uh, Rebels definitely have some tools, I think, for Hostage. And I think probably specifically if you're running like Jedi Luke with R2, which is definitely a thing, even with expensive R2, because R2 is still great with Luke and he's still great in general. Uh, I think you could definitely make a strong case to take Hostage. Yeah, I mean, R2 is just good because... It all it it takes more than a sixty point unit to kill him, right? Like even with three PO, like it's just like you you need, yeah. Um, but I agree. I I think that like the Jedi Luke R two list is probably the most likely Rebel list to want this. Um, I think Separatists. You're probably taking this in Dooku list. Probably leaving it at home with Grievous. Um, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I think you're more apt to take in a Dooku list than a Grievous list, at least. Um, Empire lists, I think... I don't Barrier know. Palpatine. Eh, I don't know. Barrier Palpatine. Maybe. Because they can't even they can't even try and chip your hostage. Because isn't that, isn't that kind of like a bit of the dichotomy of hostage is that you have like... You almost have like two different battles going on at once, right? You have one where you try to make a decision if it's worth going for the hostage carrier to kind of then make them come grab their hostage and slow them down getting to their, their deployment zone or two, you realize that you can't do that and you just go for the points that you possibly can. And the best thing about Palp, right, is that he's always sitting around the bulk of the army anyways. So let's say you want to shoot the hostage carrier barrier. They want to shoot something else for points barrier. I just think that's a good build to put that in. I, I could see it. I guess. I mean, you, you can also use pull the strings on your hostage, which yeah. could be a snow trooper unit, and then you get an attack also out of it at the same time. So it's pretty, it seems pretty good. Yeah. Um, I mean, Vader probably wants it, right? Vader's might. I, so I mean, like, uh, maybe I don't know. I'm like, I've played a lot of Vader, and I've played a lot of non clone hostage lists, hostage fights with Vader, and I'm I'm still not sure. I, I'm I'm not sold on it. I guess uh, it so hostage shuts down. Darkness descends almost completely. Is is a, is like a notable uh, problem because darkness and not that darkness descends is like turns out to be like super good, but um, basically you can't play the card if you're gonna play hostage. Um, I don't know. Uh, Invader's still super slow is my biggest issue he, he a lot of times he like shows up late to the hostage party um i don't know yeah i get it and it's it's worth mentioning because you mentioned maul earlier i think if you're playing maul on hostage you might consider saving phantom menace for the the pseudo like limb, limb vis effect just because that hostage you drop is also going to hedge out any sort of decent maul infiltrate positions especially because unlike vader he does not get a scout move after he after he deploys so yeah and i think just kind of like on the mall i guess kind of like to circle around to the vader thing i just i think most force users do it better than than vader generally like he's got some interesting toolsy things in his kit that help with it but like all the force users do and i think most of the other ones are just like mostly kind of better at what it's doing um choke is great but again, I think if I'm trying to do that, I'd I'd rather take Maul, um, you know, to to be the the speedy guy getting in there. So, um, yeah. You can also use new ways to get your hostage out faster. You can. Uh, it also makes them easier to kill. To yeah, some degree. I know. It's it's yeah. it's like a little bit of a non bow. Yeah, I yeah. I. I love new ways to motivate them as like an idea and a card effect, but it just like it 
feels bad. The only unit in the game I've ever felt good about using new ways to motivate them on is Bosk. Um, and it's not particularly close because he's just like, oh, I'm going to heal this wound. Like, I was going to say, it's like, because he's got, it's, he's got regen, that's why. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've, I've done it a couple of times on Aiden. It's fine. But again, like you're like, ooh, I'm never getting this wound back. You know, um, so it's, 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 a, it's a pretty steep cost. It is, and it's a really good effect. It Don't is a very unique and, like, and strong effect. Um, yeah. But I find that, like, oftentimes you, like, a two pip is not, like, the pip you want that effect on. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a little awkward. Anyway, this is not a Vader cast. This is a uh, hostage it's cast. It's always a Vader cast. <laughs> uh, so how do you guys... So we, we talked a little bit about kind of now that standby sharing is no longer a thing and this is no longer a clones only objective who wants to take it so let's move on to how do you actually play this objective tactically like how do you approach hostage as an objective yeah um so i think that there are two really important points here and you got to kind of decide how you want to play the game. But, like, you can choose to be aggressive or defensive, as is always, you know, whatever. But your choice at the beginning of turn two is the most important choice you're going to make all game. And the choice, I was kind of alluding to it with the cunning uh, situation, is at the beginning of turn two, you can either decide to shoot their hostage carrier or decide to get yours to safety and um <laughs> you know I, it it's really hard to say which is the right call um because i think it really depends on the situation and what the um stats are there to like blow the enemy away like if you're facing down like a rebel trooper unit like i th i think i'm in camp shoot it um if you're facing you know, if, if, if you're shooting at, you know, phase two clones backed up by surge tokens, you're, you're not nearly as likely as to one shot that unit, right? Like, like if you take the shot and they get away, um, you could be in trouble. Um, it's also very important that like priority at the beginning of turn two, is also super important. Like you, you know, so having a unit that can like utilize a one pip, um, effectively on on turn turn two i think is super important um and i think this kind of plays a little bit into the force user equation right like what you know you play one pip and you like know where the order is going like you don't want to play like have like a veer's max firepower and be fishing something out of the bag on turn two like that's not where you want to be um so i i think that if, if you're playing hostage exchange, you need to have a plan for, and, and you, and you can have this plan before the game begins really, because, because this is going to happen every time. Um, you know, you need, you need to have a way to get an order to whatever unit is going to need it. And, and, and either you will put yourself in a situation where you can flex and you can throw an order down on a, on a, on a lethal unit that can kill their hostage carrier or you can throw a, a unit down on a core, which I think is, you know, it, it is less common than lists run ambush nowadays because um, they're often running two characters or they're running like the Vader Luke thing and they've just got the suite. Um, and, and, and having a one pip that is core eligible is like less of a thing. So, um, I mean, clearly a list with like Dooku in it has a little bit more play to it because it's like I can just throw ambush on anything. Um, but, but I, I think the crux of this conversation is how do you respond to the start of turn two? Because that's how the rest of the game is going to play out. Yeah. And I, I think you kind of nailed most of it. Um, I, I think the key is that like, if you are putting it in your deck is to kind of like, Hostage is another one of those one of those objectives that probably benefits from having reps. I know I've we probably have alluded to this in every vital assets card. It probably it feels like because they are a little more intrinsic than the other objectives, right? Like there's a lot more to them. Um, 
than say just placing some vaps and you know killing some things um but like it's one of those things where you build a list you put hostage exchange in it you have to kind of understand how it plays against each faction and then also understand how it plays against certain units um and that can only come by practicing uh, I mean, you can always theory craft. I'm not saying you can't. It's it's definitely something you can solve by theory craft. I'm not like I don't think you actually have to play the like the reps completely out to understand how it works. It's almost like practicing chess. And maybe this is because I watched Queen's Gambit like over the past like week. Actually, I don't know if it took us a week to binge it. We watched it pretty quickly. But like it's almost like chess, right? Where you can kind of like visualize how it can kind of play out. And you think of the certain things that can go go through the course of rounds one and two, which are the most important and hostage that you've alluded to, Mike. And you kind of, if you do build a list with hostage, you have to understand what it can do versus the factions and the units in them and go into that game with that game plan. And I usually don't suggest that. Like, I, I usually think that you want to have a plan A, B, and a C. And you still want to have a plan B. I'm not saying it's going to be all roses here where your plan a is going to work but plan a going into the game is the one that you want to try and execute and obviously if plan a fails then you go for plan b um but plan b is more of an emergency plan um right because like if it's one of those cards that if you are bringing it the list is functioning around it rather than adapting to it is how i feel so suppose you have no access to extra victory points like secret mission or bounty and your red player. Is this kind of an easy, like my priority is making sure that my opponent's hostage doesn't get away? Because if, if your opponent gets their hostage away and you get your hostage away, it's one to one. But then if you're red player and nobody's killed anything, you lose. Which means that you're still on offense, even if in that situation. Well, um, I do think it's... So it's important to... Um, I think, like, su- suppression is is important. Panicking, also important. Um, in that, you know, you, they get two points if they get it back to their deployment zone, right? So, like, um, the last situation you want is, like, a two-to-one thing. Um, and, and so... I think as red player, um, if you don't have the tools in your toolkit to like make sure you kill on turn two uh, immediately, which I think is likely a lot of the time, um, I think I think you just got to get your hostage to safety. Um, I, I now I think it, that also depends on like the likelihood of your core unit surviving an attack or whatever. Um, but like if you're playing rebels. Um, if you don't win priority, you're gonna your hostage is gonna drop almost. I mean, you should assume it's gonna drop probably, because um, they're gonna like hit it with an arc trooper shot or a DT shot, and you're gonna roll six saves or whatever, and and, and maybe you luck out, but um, I don't think that that's super great for you. But but I think that um, if you can make your opponent drop the hostage like twice over the course of the game they may not be able to get it to their deployment zone um which is which is important they gotta which leads me to another point i think about hostage exchange always make sure you have a secondary unit that can pick it up if it drops even if you don't think it's gonna drop if they get lucky or they force choke your unit leader you're really gonna want a second unit ready to go um one of the biggest mistakes i've i've made in hostage over over the course I, and one of them was on stream it was in invader league single a limbs i i you know i was playing as a ton list and like i was like oh he he like set up like super far away from the hostages and the hostages were just kind of in the middle of the map and i was like all right i'm gonna blow his army away and i did but like a pair of tauntauns got a hold of my hostage carrier and i was like oh um rex bailed me out of that one by jumping in there and picking it up but um i you know you don't want to be in that situation ever like if your hostage is on the ground somebody needs to be able to pick it up that turn um 
at any possible moment. I remember watching that. I was like, oh, Mike's got this in the bag. I'm not even going to watch. And then I tuned back in like 15 minutes later and I was like, what the hell happened? And uh, I mean, you pulled it out, but um, it was just funny. Um, my other advice is, well, a couple of things, right? Is you always need to be counting, especially in this, in this situation. Um, you need to be counting activations. You need to be counting points destroyed because it's a lot of times it'll be coming down to that. Um, and like, always be, always be aware of the dice that your opponent can throw and the dice that you can throw. Um, it's a dice game after all, right? Um, and dice pools in this game have been trending upward. And like you said, Mike, a lot of the times, like your white save unit might be having to save a lot because their your opponent's going to throw a lot at them if they have the opportunity to, right? Um, there's, I think it's tough. I, I do think that there are, I do think that there are games as red player where you're going to think that you can kill their hostage carrier and the dice will betray you. And now you kind of have your foot in your mouth because you kind of went all in on that play and it didn't work. And that unit's activated and they're kind of stuck there and they might be free points. Uh, depending on the situation. Um, another key piece of advice is cohesion is key. Um, if you do, I know like a lot of that, I know cohesion in general, you always want to make sure that you're kind of like, obviously behind your unit leader, right? But you want to make sure that you have another model somewhat visible behind your unit leader from a lot of different angles. Because the last thing that you want is to see your opponent with like a shore trooper unit, just cohere their T21B out to only see your unit leader at range four and roll a couple of crits. Because guess what? You're dropping that hostage exchange, you know, you're dropping the hostage and you're not losing a unit. And yes, they can easily pick up that unit when they activate, but they're slowing you down. And that's the last thing you want is to be kind of sniped into that situation, which can happen often because you'll cohere and you'll be like, oh, I'm cohered. I can't get shot. I feel good. And next thing you know, something co swings outward and your unit leader is the only thing they can see. Um, and you don't want that happening. So while sometimes it might not be ideal to kind of swing a guy outward behind your unit leader, you might want to do it anyways. I think, you know, I think that's a really good point. I think to reinforce that though, um, regardless of how many dudes you can like do that with, you're not always going to be able to like prevent that from happening. Right. Oh, totally. So, totally. So I think uh, maybe something that's additionally important here. And frankly, these same rules can be applied to recover the supplies too. It's just, there's a little bit more play there and that like often your recover boxes are a lot safer. Um, but uh, you want to be able to have more than one, more than just the unit leader in the squad, be able to base like in base contact with the objective token. So you don't have to move again to pick it up. If it does drop, um, that is also important being able to, cause if you have to like move back to it and then claim it, you're stuck there. And like, you've just lost a turn as opposed to being able to pick it up and then continue moving away. You've only lost half a turn. Um, I know that it, it feels a little negligent or negligent, negligible. Um, kind of on the surface it ends up being a really big deal you know to lose a whole activation as opposed to half to half of an activation because your unit leader got scoped you have 12 actions a game yeah 12 yeah 12 actions a game so like so if you have to use two of those actions to do things rather than you know one uh it, that's a big deal so no totally are you ever attacking with your hostage carriers instead of moving Yes, I've done it. Um, uh, should, I did, should you is a better question. Um, I did it against, believe it or not, I did it against David in one of our um, games for the, uh, uh, word I can't think of, the campaign. And if you go watch that game, I know that I am not getting away with my hostage carrier. He had an ATSD and it was Endor. I had nowhere to go. So I literally, and I'm pretty sure I say this on the, on the stream, I go, this hostage carrier has no chance of surviving. 
I'm just going to aim and shoot. And um, so I do think that there are games where you can see the fact that you're just not going to do anything with your hostage and take that shot. Um, But at that point, you're all in on basically going to points destroyed and hoping you win, right? You're, you're hoping that both hostages don't get scored. Like you sit, you try to wait out your opponent, get up an activation, kill their hostage carrier timely, right? So that they're not holding a hostage. You're not holding a hostage and you win on points. Um, it's not ideal. It's definitely not the way I suggest playing hostage exchange, but I do think that those scenarios will happen. Um, it's definitely a, a list dependent situation. Um, well, I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, try and say that you should be in that situation. Um, but, uh, I do think there, yes, there is, there's one situation where I think it's okay. And I think it's in the Anakin Padme list. And I think when you have a phase two with Overwatch, um and standby sharing is still a thing um i think it's totally tenable i think oftentimes you're gonna still want to double move with them to get them back safely into standby sharing range um but i think some games you may not need to do that specifically like if you've infiltrated with padme and have her in a good spot um you might not need to do that um so yeah, I mean, just as someone who's played a lot of hostage exchange standby sharing, like having the untargetable phase two Z6 just kind of like sit there with like basically three attacks in the can. And, and the fact of the matter is they just touch all of your opponent's list at range three Overwatch. It's it's a really, I've literally had had opponents on turn two like on on their first activation of the turn be like okay i'm flipping my order token face down i'm not taking any actions and then they did that with every one of their units and and i'm not sure they were wrong to do that um (laughs) you know and well luckily that's not a world we live in anymore well i I, i'm not sure that's true um completely i mean it's not a world we will frequently live in anymore um it's It's still possible to some degree with anakin padme although (laughs) Which will be the hard to navigate. You can, you can only do it twice instead of, you know, nine times or whatever. Totally. It's it's going to depend a lot more on terrain. And you can't really yep. do a lot of cohesion shenanigans with it because clearly Anakin and Padme are solo units that can't extend their their kind of sphere of influence bubble like a normal clone unit can. So, um, but, I mean, but you're I, also talking about using like 280 points. Like, not like 280, probably like 200 and like, 60 points of two characters to do this too so it's it comes at a cost right it comes at a cost but when you're playing hostage exchange it probably wins you the game um yeah like, yeah like, that's fair to be fair like um y- you know i it'll it'll be interesting to see if those lists can survive um but i do think that like if there's a place where you're attacking regularly on turn one with your hostage carrier unit that's it. I I think basically in almost every other situation I can think of, you should be double moving and like not thinking twice. So you you guys talked about two scenarios basically. If if your hostage is gonna die anyway. So even if you double move and then sorry, go ahead. I'd like to point out that I sort of disagree with that one. I think I okay. think that I think that you need that token as close to your dudes that can pick it up as possible. Um so it should be noted that it was I was forced to bring Han before the change. <laughs> so, so that was strike strike strike, strike one. one. <laughs> strike number two was I had nowhere safe to bring my hostage because even if I were to double move and then grab my hostage, the ATST would then nuke me off the board again. So it was definitely like a situation where I assessed the board and was like no matter where I bring this token, I'm not going to be able to retain this token because I think it was like advanced positions or something like that. And on the map on Endor is like those hills. And the only way I could do is like walk up the hill. And I would just get continually get nuked off the board. So I was like, I need to concede that point. And I just basically need to try and table David, except for the ATSD, which I did except for the one model holding the hostage, believe it or not. I, like, I almost tabled David except for one model, which was holding the hostage. 
I, I think that's fair. I just, I'm not sure if, like, there's ever a point where, like, you should you should really want to be trying to do that, right? Like, Oh, I, I didn't want to do uh, it. I, let's, let's be real. Yeah, I didn't yeah. no, I did not want to be doing that. Um, it didn't feel right doing it. And I think I said it like a million times, like this feels terrible. Yeah. Um, but it was like kind of all I had uh, based on I, I, the map yeah. and the situation. I get that. I mean, I guess my, my biggest advice is that if, if like you feel like after turn zero, you have to throw a hail Mary to win the game. Like, uh, something, <laughs> something's gone horribly wrong. You know? Oh, totally. Um, totally. I don't know. I, I think that I think that if I was in that situation, I would still try and double move. Just I don't know. I'm not sure. Like, it, was it a naked rebel trooper or did it have a DLT? Uh, DLT. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I think it's hard to say. I I think I'm still on team move, even even if it's gonna get tanked, just so that that maybe there's an off chance I can pick it up on turn six or something. Um, and and it be, yeah, would be I easier agree. to do that later in the game. I just trying to sink your out on um like basically making sure that you table them is tough i it's been a long time since i tabled somebody completely in legion and i play clones it's <laughs> it's it's very difficult in a serious game to even come close to doing that yeah yeah it was uh wasn't a decision I liked making. But no, was... I know. I, I get it. <laughs> it uh, should be fair that I had rapid reinforced Cl- uh, Mandalorians in his backfield to kind of deal with his hostage late if I needed to. So I was basically hoping that I went up activations and then killed his hostage carrier late and just go to a tie on points and I would win. His hostage carrier just decided to survive, <laughs> to survive the onslaught. That's all. Well, and, you know, the best... Often the best tactic is one that doesn't require rolling any dice, even if your outcome is like reasonably certain, right? So yeah, I think I'm I think I'm with you, Mike. I think it's basically other than the Anakin Padme shenanigans you mentioned. I think almost without exception, you're just double moving your hostage. There are a couple situations probably where you know on subsequent turns, like on turn three plus, you can kind of single move, get to safety, and then. Or, you know, take a shot and then single move and still get to perfect safety based on your position on the table. Um, but generally speaking, on those first couple turns when it's still kind of like up in the air, what's going to happen to your hostage? Um, yeah, I'm in, I'm in camp double move also. All right, so suppose you have a situation where you are now... It's now become abundantly clear that you're going to tie on victory points, like both... Both players have successfully retrieved their hostages all the way back to the deployment zone. You're looking at a two to two situation. You're also tied on points because nothing's died. How do you then approach the matchup? Because this is a somewhat common situation on hostage exchange. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like a moisture evaporator scenario a lot of the time. Um, you know, I. Uh, red should be getting aggressive and blue should be kind of hunkering down it is kind of the the tldr um that's not always true again you know we we've talked about you know if, if you've got a unit that's particularly vulnerable that you can't you know save like like an atst or something that like is going to get picked apart um at range and you can't hide it maybe you need to be the more aggressive person um but i think on the whole it plays out similar to moisture evaporators and you need to treat it that way. Now, with that being said, I think that like, if you're red on hostage, you should be doing the most you can to avoid that situation. Um, You should be chipping away. Like red should be trying to chip away all game long at units or a unit to then kind of like insulate them so that blue can't hunker down. Right. Like, um, using your snipers to focus down like a low save unit or like a low health unit or just, you know, I just think that you should constantly as, as red, I mean, blue too, of course, but mainly on this topic, red should be trying to chip away unit. So when you come to that realization, you can finish that unit and turn yourself into blue essentially. Um, I, I also think that the, the second way to play this um, is to kind of steer clear of the points destroyed thing in its entirety. 
Um, and, and this only works if you have specific units um, and, and make them drop their hostage carrier when they can't pick it back up. Um, you've got to be up on activations to do this. You've got to have a unit that can enable you to do that. Often snipers, uh, like, like a, like a Iden sniper rifle or, uh, uh, is, is probably the, one of the better tools at that. Um, you could also like, just like really get in there with a force choke user. Um, that's also like reasonable, you know, mall operative Vader could do that, um, like, like that's a that's a scenario you can work towards a little bit more than the point the, the points destroyed thing and that you can really I mean you're probably gonna have to kill stuff anyways to make that happen a lot of the time um, but it, but it is worth noting that that is something that you can try to do um, a lot of times it kind of makes if, if you haven't whittled down the hostage unit um, a bit it, it could be tough to do that um, if your opponent coheres correctly. Um, but it's worth noting that that is a thing that's on the table, similar to recover the supplies. Yep. I mean, I don't th so you're talking about situations like where you have 11 activations and your opponent has 10 and on the very last activation of the game, you drop their hostage unit leader, even if it's not killing the entire unit and boom, game's over. Yeah, or or if it's or you're like ten to ten and you you know you lost priority yeah, intentionally yeah, right. or whatever, right? So um, you don't necessarily have to be up on activations for it to work. Um, I, you know, there are also other situations where you can like get in there with Maul Invader, you know, um, force choke the unit that uh, has it, um, and then like force push another unit far that too far away to actually be able to pick it up. Um, and, and, like, melee, like, the unit that has it, you know, there's some situations there, too. Um, but but on the whole, yeah, I mean, it's you, you've got to go last with whatever unit. And, and sometimes it's a little bit of a gamble, um, you know, uh, unless you've got some way to get, like, ID name tokens or something. Um, but, but it's something yep. you have more control over potentially then points destroyed is what you're getting it's a more it's a more control it's a possibly a more controlled variable is what you're aiming at here it depends on the situation it also like yeah. heavily depends on the terrain makeup of the board you know like um it's it's tough it's one of those things where like it's not it's often going to be not correct to do that but there are situations where like when you can do it, you can do it uh, like a hundred percent of the time if you plan for it. Um, but when you can't do it, you can also can not do it a hundred percent of the time because there's just n the terrain isn't going to work out. So it it you kind of have to be able to plan for it. So it works sixty percent of the time. All the time, time. works all the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the the reason I point that out is because the times that it doesn't work, you should be kind of aware that it's not going to work ahead of time and and go the points destroyed route, right? Um, but but you need to be able to kind of make that distinction and and that's important. All right. Well, uh, you guys got any final wrap up thoughts on hostage exchange? Um, you know, I think that it's a, a super interesting objective now. Um, you know, I'm I'm glad that we are gonna get to see it. Um, played in the spirit i think that it was meant to be played in as opposed to the one that we got um although it won me many a game uh those games were not fun uh at all um and uh you know i think it'll be nice to play some actual hostage exchange i think they often will lead to very chaotic game states and um i think that's always good for fun um if you know even if it's not like um, something super consistently uh, doable. Um, I hope that the recent changes to mostly everything that I felt was wrong with the card will give it new life for me. Um, uh, if anyone knew me uh, about last March, April time when I was putting together Invader League, I wanted to take this card and burn it. And uh, I have felt very passionately about burning this card for a long time. But I do think that um, everything that's happened in the past, you know, month or so has been very good for the card, and I think that it could 
probably changed my views. Uh, I'm not one to hold grudges. So I'll, uh, I'll, C- I'll certainly hope- not against pieces of cardboard, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, um, if you know if i burn it i burn it um i will say that my favorite thing about hostage exchange is that uh rune hako and senator chuchi are actually are arguably two of the better models in legion i think they are fantastic models um i actually think rune hako might be my best painted miniature (laughs) like i know that sounds crazy to say that but i enjoyed painting him and i actually did him really well i haven't painted chuchi yet but I actually think he might be my best painted model. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, either way, uh, when I I look forward to playing hostage exchange with those models uh, specifically. Yeah, I'm excited. I, uh, I mean, you guys know that I love separatists and most separatist lists are good at the subjective notionally in a post standby sharing world. So I'm pretty excited. I'm, I'm a, unabashed at dooku slash mall player so he says dooku slash mall like he's playing them independently they're in the yeah. same list every yeah. time and they're both pretty good at this so. <laughs> come on you gotta we gotta keep something some stuff on the dl for invader league right um, no no we don't <laughs> i have not decided on a faction yet it's i'm gonna waffle for the next six weeks you, uh, don't, you don't even have to it's it's unlocked well i know yeah there well, you, go. I, you have to if you don't want to like you still have to practice you can't do you? just do you have to practice look i mean i mean maybe not I, my best invader season was the one where i went in cold <laughs> so, with no <laughs> to new faction uh so i don't know yes is the short answer you should practice uh, everybody benefits from practice so please do not wing it um even though it's full unlock try those try those crazy builds before round robin not during round round. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway, um, we'll talk a ton about Invader League. Oh, uh, we should plug Battle Lines. Um, please go make some maps. Check out the announcement on the Discord. If you are not on the Discord, just post. I mean, you can contact us. We can send you an invite link, but also just post randomly on f- the, the Legion Facebook. Somebody will find you a link. So Yeah, I think um, LJ posted the details on the Facebook at yeah, some yeah. point this week, too. But anyway, we need maps for Invader. Uh, good maps. The focus is on certainly, you know, they can look pretty, but the focus is on them gonna is going to be on them being competitively viable and functional, such that the players are f- playing each other and not the map. <laughs> so yeah, um, um, I'm judging with uh, I think Keegan and Nerfly. So I think what we're gonna do is have the community vote on like five maps that end up being the best and then we're going to pick three of the five or something like that okay. but either way we have like a specific way that we're going to judge those five maps and i can tell you as i have scissors in my hand don't ask me why um it's going to be focused on playability more than anything like i know it's going to want to look cool and i get that um but invader league's a big tournament and we want um the maps to be uh solid you know um we did some experimenting last season and uh you know while i was good i think going to basics with some fan-made stuff will be cool too yeah there were there were some absolutely gorgeous maps last season that just were really difficult in some ways to play on so um yeah hopefully somewhere in between this season but uh, yeah please go out and make maps people we need i'm I'm dabbling in map making with my limited technical skills. <laughs> um, if nothing else, says the uh, guy that made Notorious Scoundrels tokens. You know, like, yeah, you know. uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I can watch YouTube videos, but uh, I, mostly I just I am a a perennial or rather seasonal uh, couch quarterback when it comes to <laughs> map quality. So I figured um, it would be good to at least. You know, it's always good to give constructive criticism while simultaneously having like a good, strong appreciation for all the work that goes into something. So I'm hoping at least to get a little bit in, into the inside of the ladder because I know it is a ton of work to make a good map and the map makers put a ton of thought and effort and everything into it. So, um, yeah, thank you to map makers. And uh, I would encourage anyone that has not 
tried to make one to go in and just mess around with it and maybe turn something in for battle lines, because the more maps we get for this, the better. So, all right. Well, that's all I got. I think we're good. All right. Get some painting done. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I'm going to go play Call of Duty instead. <laughs> there we go. I got a lot of ARC troopers to paint. Yeah. No, I, I have... I have entirely too much. I uh, I have a lot of B twos to paint now. <laughs> I thought I thought my core days, my days of painting droid core were done, but just uh, paint them like Cylons. Yeah. That's all no, I they're, ask. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna be they're gonna be super easy. I'm just gonna do metallics. I might even do like metallics are ridiculously easy to paint. Um, I mean, you just you just base coat them. If you have an airbrush, you can even like do like a zenith highlight, and it looks really fancy, even though you did literally nothing except spray them with paint. And uh, then you throw a wash on them, and you dry brush them, and you're done. Um, and that's what I'm gonna do. I might even just use like colored, different colored washes, because that'll kind of tint them differently for the different units. Like you have like a blue wash and a purple wash, and it looks pretty cool with B twos on the metallics. So I might even do that, and then I don't have to go in and like paint stripes on there. <laughs> on their shoulders or whatever this is like even less effort there you go. um we'll see i don't know uh, they're really cool models so i want to at least do them proper justice uh but uh yeah i <laughs> got more backlog anyway we are the notorious scoundrels i'm kyle i'm mike i'm zach do not run with scissors <laughs> and stay fresh cheese bags <laughs>